What is your view on psychological egoism? If we're all ultimately acting out of self-interest, then does altruism have any merit? I don't think the question's well posed. And that's, it's one of those questions that leads into a philosophical uh, dead end because it's not well posed. You, there isn't any such thing as self-interest. It's not the right way to think about it because you're not alone. And so this is why I like Piaget, Jean Piaget, because he thought about this intelligently. Look, first of all, whose self-interest do you mean? Do you mean your immediate self-interest in the next second? So that would be impulsive pleasure. We're all acting for, for the gaining of impulsive pleasure and to hell with everything else. Well, obviously, that's a stupid way to behave because, and everyone knows that, because you can do impulsive, short-term gratifying things like snort cocaine now, and you can keep doing that, and it, it'll pay off real, real well in the extremely short term, and it'll just auger you into the ground in the medium to long term. So if you're acting in your own self-interest, let's take that apart. Over what period of time? Your self-interest in the next second? Your self-interest in the next hour? Like if you're impulsive and you want to gratify an impulse, you're obviously acting in your self-interest in the next second or the next two seconds or the next minute. But you know, you'll pay for that. Maybe you punch someone or you slap someone because you're so angry and they, you know, and they knock you for a loop and, and then they charge you with assault. You know, so, well, it was great in your self-interest in the second, but like future, remember that Simpsons episode, Homer drank a quart of mayonnaise and, and vodka and, and Marge and all his kids were telling him not to. And he said, well, that's a problem for future Homer. I sure don't envy that guy. It's like, which is one of the best Simpsons lines ever, I think. And well, that's it exactly. It's like, well, there isn't just you. There's, there's now you and there's tonight you and there's Tomorrow morning you, that's the one that'll have the hangover, by the way. And there's next week you, and next month you, and next year you, and old you. And so if you're going to act in your self-interest, you have to take that collective of yous across time into account when you make your decision. And now here's the cool thing about that. So then let's say, well, that would be acting in your self-interest, writ large, right, across time spans. But the thing is, future you and someone else that you have to live with right now that's not you are pretty much the same people. And so if you're going to act in your self-interest and you have other people around you, then you also want to act in their self-interest because otherwise they won't like you. They won't cooperate with you and they won't compete with you in a reasonable manner. And so that's going to be a catastrophe. And so you want to act out what's good for you now and what's good for you next month and next year. And you want to do that in a way that's good for you and your family and your community right now, next week, and next year. And you're going to take all those things into account at the same time. That's an equilibrated game from a Piagetian perspective. And it was his idea that that constituted the basis for proper moral judgment. And it's a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant idea. And so that's your true self-interest. There's no difference between your interest and the interest of others. Not in any fundamental sense. Even your enemies, which is why you're enjoined to treat your enemy as if he was yourself. Because he is. You know, and you think, well, you should wish well, you should wish your enemies well. Well, why? Well, it isn't that you hope they get a bigger house than you. It's that, let's say you're, you're being pursued and tormented by someone who's truly reprehensible. That person is, they have a miserable life, man, in all likelihood. Let's say they're truly malevolent. You know, they live in hell. And what you might hope for them is that they could figure out how to get out of there because it's not good for them and it's not good for anyone else. Think, well, even your enemies, it's like, wouldn't it be good if they could get their act together and stop being so unnecessarily malevolent? And that's in your self-interest. So the idea that your self-interest is somehow opposed to other people's or that if you maximize your self-interest, you're not operating in the best interests of other people is predicated on a poor idea of what constitutes your self-interest because you're not separate in any real sense from other people. You may be not separate from everything in some real sense. You know, I mean, Jung, Jung, in his book, Mysterium Conjunctionis, he had this idea. I'm going to go through it real quick. It's a complicated idea that w this is how you put yourself together. The first thing you do is you, you join your emotions and your, and your rationality so that, so that your mind and your emotions are one thing. He called that the first conjunction. Um, so that your motivations and your emotions and the way that you think about the world are all acting in the same direction. 
Okay, so that's the first conjunction, and you get your act together that way. So that would mean incorporation of aggression and sexuality from a Freudian perspective. Those parts of you that are difficult to integrate come to be integrated into one thing. So you can use your anger when you need to, and you have your sexuality under control. It doesn't have you, but you know how to use it, and it's a power for you. Um, and and you're properly assertive in all of those things. And so you, you build yourself into one psychological unit and then you embody that. So that's the second conjunction. The second conjunction is take your mind, emotion, motivation, unity and act it out. Act it out in the world so that there's no distinction between you and what you do. Between you and the way you think about the world and your philosophy and how you act. That makes you a second kind of unity. And then the final conjunction, which is the most difficult one, is to stop thinking that the world is different than you are. This is why I ask people to clean up their rooms. It's like, your room is you. It's you. And so you go in there and you clean up your room. You're cleaning you up too, the same way. You're developing discipline. You're putting yourself in order. You're developing a vision of the future. You're figuring out how to dress. You're figuring out how to take care of your things. You're interacting with the microcosmos that you have in front of you and learning how to balance chaos and order. There's no difference between you and what's around you. And that's a very difficult thing to understand. And so you want to act in a way that's good for you, but good for everything else at the same time. And that's, that's a high moral virtue. And that's... So there is... A, there, that's the right way of thinking about the relationship between psychological egoism and altruism. It's like if you're, as you move towards a broader conceptualization of things, you start to understand that there is no selfish self in, there is no selfish self interest. It, it, it isn't how life works. Like if you're married to someone, for example, and you're stuck with them for the next 50 years, it's like you can't win an argument with them. You can make peace because they're you, man. They're you. They're a huge part of your experience. You have to treat that person as if they are you. And that, that it's not, it isn't like, well, I'm going to treat you well because you're me. It's because people don't treat themselves very well often. It's way more complicated than that. You just, you don't want to defeat your wife, man, because then you live with a defeated wife. And if you think she isn't going to take revenge on you, then you're, you're not very bright. So you want to listen to what she has to say and you want to listen to her problems and you want to help her solve them because she's you. And you want to do the same with your kids and then you want to do the same with the people around you if you can do it. So, and so the whole idea of like, well, we're basically wired to be selfish. Well, we are when we're not very wise and we act impulsively. But as your view of the world broadens, you start to understand that this is why in... In the Buddhist philosophy, you know, Buddha attained nirvana, so that meant he could stay in union with the gods, so to speak. He, he attained the highest form of, of subjective experience, which might, be, which might be something like total immersion in, in bliss and meaning. But he rejected it because he went back into the world to help other people attain nirvana, or at least to move towards it, because he realized that there was no individual redemption without the redemption of all. And you, if you don't understand that, then you're just not very wise. And so you're trying to be a force for good in the world. And that doesn't mean just good for you. That's just, it's just blind. Because there isn't any isolated you. It, that isn't how things are. That isn't how reality lays itself out. So...